Okay, good morning, everybody. It's a couple minutes after nine, so we'll get started here. Um, a couple of housekeeping items uh, for attendees. Please note your phone lines have been muted by default during the presentation. We'll be addressing questions at the end of this session as we do have a fair amount of content to go through in about half an hour. Please feel free to submit questions online at any time by using the chat panel, and we'll address these at the conclusion of the presentation. My name is Chris Kerbing from CED and Royal Wholesale, and on behalf of the CED, Royal Wholesale, and CES teams, I want to thank you for attending this 11th session of our monthly application webinar series. The topic, the topic we're focusing on this morning is a central process utility plant controls upgrade, which required 100% uptime on all utilities. This presentation is being delivered by Banks Integration a Rockwell Solution partner and one of our preferred integration teams throughout California. At this point, I'll let Tom Brown from Banks Integra Integration introduce himself and we'll get started. Tom? Hi, thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Tom. I work with Banks Integration and today um, we'll go through um, a quick agenda here for this project that we recently completed go through the project overview, um, talk about the system selection process, um, go through the system design at a high level, and then talk about some of the lessons learned uh, for the project. A little bit of background on Banks Integration, uh, who we are. Uh, we're a Rockwell Automation Solution Partner. We focus primarily in the life sciences, and we service uh, Northern California, um, the, mostly the West Coast here. And we've been in business for about 20 years, a little bit over 20 years. Um, project overview, this was a central process utility plant upgrade. Uh, there were five uh, chillers and six cooling towers. Um, there was four uh, air compressors as well, along with the uh, distribution systems for both. <clears throat> Some of the reasons the customer wanted to uh, do this project, there was um, mixed I.O. signals between the two systems, between the refrigerated water and the compressed air. So if they wanted to make code changes on the refrigerated water side, they would have to bring down the compressed air and vice versa. So they wanted to segregate the I.O. between the two systems. The um, controls hardware was obsolete. It was a WinView HMI um, platform and PLC5 controllers, which are obsolete. And there was a lot of dead code from the legacy system um, which made the system difficult to troubleshoot and maintain. There was no remote access or individual user logins um, because of the old WinView app, HMI application. And then there was limitations around their DH Plus network. Uh, this system was spanned between several buildings and um, periodically they would have issues um, with remote racks dropping out, and they didn't have a lot of visibility into the system to provide adequate troubleshooting um, in a timely manner. And then they had a lot of uh, remote I.O. racks for the PLCs mixed in the MCCs with the 480-volt um, power that they wanted to move the um, remote racks into lower voltage, 120-volt or below um, panels. The original control system architecture had two um, 580 PLCs shared between the refrigerator water and the compressed air. Uh, there were four Allen Bradley Slick PLCs, uh, one per compressor, and there was two HMI stations um, shared between three buildings. So there wasn't a lot of visibility into the system, being that there's only one HMI per, per uh, building. The software that was used on the original system was ArsLogix 5 and 500, and again with the WinView HMI. And the network was three DH Plus networks spanning between the um, three buildings, one for the SCADA and interprocessor PLC to PLC uh, communications, and then two for the remote I.O. networks, um, and there was a Modbus interface to interface with the chillers. Um, the existing system, one of the um, things that the customer wanted to upgrade was create a redundant um, control layer. So that was one of the items that they were really focusing on for the project. Some of the challenges, um, the project was fairly large and it spread across several buildings. Um, it impacted 22 control panels 
and there are seven um, VFDs. The uh, tower water pumps were 450 horsepower, so they were fairly large uh, motors. The project required 100% uptime on the utilities throughout the projects. So throughout the startup, um, we had to have uh, several air compressors and several chillers and cooling towers up at all times. The existing equipment, um, at the time, the, there wasn't a lot of visibility into the process, so uh, the client didn't actually know that the, there was a lot of equipment failures. But as we started going through the I.O. checks during startup, we discovered that there was a lot of equipment that just wasn't functional um, to start with. There's a lot of drawings and documents for the system. It was a GMP uh, uh, system. I'm sorry, it was a non-GMP system. But there was still a, um, a full set of design documents and electrical drawings associated with the existing equipment. Um, the customer wanted to use a fairly new technology to that facility. They wanted to virtualize the servers. They wanted to um, change the, from their standard modules that they had in the past to um, Rockwell's process objects, and they weren't sure of that migration path. And then they wanted to get away from the DH plus and control net standard that they had in place and use an exist or a new Ethernet uh, device level ring instead. Um, so to help our customer get there, uh, you know, how do they get to that selection process? Uh, we worked with um, Rockwell Automation, and they, the customer knew that they made the decision to go with the Rockwell control system. And once they had that decision in place, we worked with them to evaluate um, whether or not the Rockwell process objects for life science was a good fit, and also we wanted to help them um, evaluate the Ethernet capacity for this upgrade. So we worked with uh, our customer and with Rockwell um, to evaluate whether or not the process objects would be a good fit, good fit for the utilities upgrade. And one of the main goals for the customer was to um, provide more visibility into the process to help the operator easily troubleshoot um, trouble calls. And so we worked with the customer. We gave an um, interactive presentation using the process objects for life science. We created some mock-up screens around their chillers and cooling towers, and then we left it on site there so that they can actually go through and um, evaluate the process objects in terms of um, complexity and ease of use. Uh, some of the things about the process objects, um, they're from Rockwell Automation, they're right out of the box. The ones that we used were for the life sciences, so they were specific to that industry. Um, as such, they're aligned with the S88 batch control standard, and so that you're able to divide those modules into an area and unit. And being aligned with the batch control standard wasn't necessarily um, the best fit for the utility upgrade, being that they're a continuous process, but our customer wanted to standardize on those modules for other projects. Being that they're a biotech customer, um, they do a lot of batch control, so these would um, we thought that they would be a good fit for future projects. Um, being that they're pre-programmed and pre-tested um, by Rockwell, they reduce the programming and validation cost of the um, control layer. And be because the process objects provide a lot of visibility in terms of interlocks and permissive, um, it allows the operator to more easily troubleshoot the um, abnormal condition. Uh, these are pre-programmed modules. What you get out of the box, you get the uh, HMI icon, you get the faceplate associated with it, and the PLC controller code in, in the form of add-on instruction. Like I said, these were for the life science um, industry, so they follow the GAMP5 uh, methodology in terms of the functional spec uh, all the way through the operational qualification that was provided uh, by Rockwell. Um, some of the benefits that the customer uh, realized there is increased visibility in terms of uh, troubleshooting. A lot of times the operators would try to turn on pumps 
or open valves and they wouldn't necessarily be able to, they click the button on the HMI on the existing system and not be able to actually open the valve or turn on the pump and not have a indication of why they couldn't do that. So with the process objects, the customer appreciated the fact that for a given pump, say if there's a pump case temperature alarm in this example, you could look at the discrete input face plate, evaluate that, yeah, there is a high um, temperature alarm. You can look at the HMI um, pump face plate, you can see that it is interlocked, and then you could open the interlock. And so one of the things that we did for the system, for every possible condition that would prevent um, or interlock a device, we actually program that into the PLC so the operator would know specifically why they couldn't start a, a pump. There was a little bit more work up front, but I think on the back end that was one of the main drivers for the customer ultimately choosing the process objects for life science. Um, another benefit, we are able to reuse a lot of the global objects provided by Rockwell. Um, so to keep a consistent HMI um, display, we are able to reuse the same um, global objects in terms of um, data entry, uh, text string displays, that type of thing to keep a very consistent look and feel from um, the standard Rockwell faceplates to the faceplates that we created specifically uh, for this project. Um, the modules do have quite a bit of configuration behind it. So Rockwell provided a um, configuration spreadsheet. And so what, how we used it, we got it to, we used the HMI interface, we got the one module to work um, how we wanted in terms of alarming and uh, color schemes and that type of thing. And then we used a spreadsheet to upload the configuration for that one particular module and then copy that configuration using Excel to all the other modules and then download it. So it did save quite a bit of time in terms of configuration. Some of the disadvantages that um, we've noticed in using the process objects for life science on a, on the past couple of projects, uh, you know, with the flexibility comes increased complexity. Uh, that's in terms of the configuration. So these modules have a lot of um, options to configure in terms of alarms, um, propagation, that type of thing. And when you have those options, it does take a little bit of time up front to configure those to make sure the system functions correctly. The process objects for life science, um, the PLC code is locked. These are pre-tested modules by Rockwell. So if you want to um, unlock the PLC code and make changes, if you want to maintain the, the validated um, testing, then you need to create a test package and um, execute that against the PLC code changes. The process objects for life science uh, are licensed per PLC, so there's a, a cost associated with those, but um, after evaluating that with the customer, we found that the cost of testing and verifying the modules was significantly higher than the cost of implementing um, a license per PLC, so there, it actually we felt it was fairly negligible for that cost. The faceplates um, in our customer, from the customer standpoint, they felt they were a little bit more complicated than their existing design. They had basically, you know, auto manual start stop, fairly basic faceplates, but the Rockwell process object faceplates provide a lot of information and the customer was a little bit concerned that the operator um, would have a learning curve and coming up to speed might be difficult. But we went through did some training with their operators and everybody came up to speed fairly quick and that actually ended up not being um, a problem for this project. Um, like I said before, the main, one of the main drivers for the project was to update the DH Plus and control net networks to Ethernet. So we worked with Rockwell's uh, Network and Security Services Group to evaluate the um, network topologies for the peer-to-peer interprocessor -peer, um, communications and the um, I.O. communications as, as well. So Rockwell um, provided um, a summary and a recommendation. They went through and provided some calculations and they also provided um, network diagrams and the design, and we worked through that with the customer. 
Um, some of the network calculations uh, that Rockwell provided, they looked at the um, RS networks for control net and laid out the entire system for the three different networks and calculated the utilization and connections um, available. Likewise, they used the Ethernet IP capacity tool to look at the Ethernet uh, limitations, and they found that the, there was more than enough bandwidth um, using the Ethernet um, network, so we ultimately chose to go with the Ethernet. Um, we decided to go with the device level ring, which is a single fault tolerant network. Um, one of the problems that the customer had in the past when the DH plus network would drop out, they didn't have real good indication of where it was broken. And so in this case, with the single fault tolerant network, um, there's an extra level of redundancy there, which they appreciated. We broke it up into three different networks, um, one for the refrigerated water, one for the compressed air, and then there's a little bit of shared equipment between the two systems. Um, so there's three, three networks. And for the segments between the buildings that were over 300 feet, um, electrical subcontractor installed uh, fiber media uh, for those longer runs. Uh, Rockwell uh, did provide for each of the networks a device level ring layout showing all the um, racks and the um, hardware that's required to complete the DLR. And then we were able to create some um, process graphics using Factory Talk View SE to indicate whether or not the PLC has lost connection to those um, modules. And then one of the nice things that Rockwell provided, they have a device level ring faceplate that'll actually tell you if there's a break in your DLR. So it'll tell you between um, one IP address and another one that there's a break. So that's an, a significant um, improvement over the old DH plus indication. So some of the system design at a high level, going from the old WinView screens to the new SE graphics, I will touch on that a little bit. Um, on the old panel, we had a PLC5. On the new, new control panels, we had a strong arm HMI with uh, new control logics, remote IO racks. For the SCADA architecture, um, this typical um, SE application, we have a redundant SCADA servers, we have redundant remote desktop servers, a factory talk directory server. Um, one thing that the customer put in was a viewpoint web server. And then we had several um, thin clients and redundant PLCs. We used uh, VMware for um, the several virtual machine servers, and we used uh, wise thin clients for the uh, uh, touchscreen interfaces. The new uh, control system architecture, we have two L73 processors. Uh, that was for the refrigerated water. We have one. Uh, L72 for the compressed air system, and um, we upgraded from the SLIC to the L72 processor for each compressor. Um, we have six HMI client stations distributed um, between the three buildings, and then we completely segregated the refrigerated water and the compressed air, which is one of the qu requirements of the project. Uh, the software is RS Logix 5000 version 20 and Factory Talk View SE version 7. Um, all the PLCs were moved to the customer's automation network, and there was three device level rings um, used for their remote I.O. and the VFD network. So looking how, at how the plant PX uh, for life sciences um, simplified the system, the existing system had about 5,000 rungs of code, over 1,000 graphics um, on the WinView station, and had about 400 electrical drawings. The new system, um, we reduced that code to about 2,000 custom lines of code. Um, and the big savings here, we only have 143 graphics down from 1,000 graphics. Um, out of that 143 graphics, 77 of those were the Rockwell faceplates that were provided. Um, so we just imported those. So we essentially had 66 graphics that we had to um, create for the project, which is um, significantly less than the 1,000 graphics that were in the existing system. 
And then we added a couple of, we had about 50 drawings um, for the new I.O. that we had in the new control panels. Some of the features that the customer um, realized at the end of the project, there was remote connections to the terminal server, and then there was a view-only connection for the factory talk viewpoint, so they can actually, um, from other areas of their facility, connect to the viewpoint to see uh, what their process was doing. They had a redundancy on the SCADAs, um, redundancy on the PLCs, and also on the network power supplies. Um, they periodically had power outages um, on their 24 volts for their network, and they had um, trouble identifying when that occurred. So we um, put in redundant 24 volt power supplies to um, help remediate that risk. And then we provide a network and power supply diagnostics on the SCADA and in terms of alarming and also in terms of um, graphical displays on the HMI. We implemented some custom um, BB code behind each screen so that we had node-based security or line of sight security so that if you're in front of um, the HMI node for the chiller, you can't turn on the air compressor. You essentially have to be standing in front of the equipment to turn on that um, associated equipment. Um, the Ethernet, I'm sorry, the Ethernet VFDs, um, we added some face plates that Rockwell provided. Uh, there was um, a requirement on the project for this to allow the um, operators and maintenance technicians to get feedback from the VFD, so Rockwell has face plates that we were able to import along with their associated add-on instructions to get diagnostic information from the VFDs. If there's alarms, um, all that comes into the face plate and it allows more ease, um, more troubleshooting capability for the operators. Um, some of the items that we took away from the project, the customer broke this project up into two, um, two phases. Uh, the first one, uh, we went through and as-built the electrical drawings um, in the uh, uh, control cabinets before the project actually started. So that saved a lot of time uh, when we actually kicked off the main project. Having those as-built um, start with saved a significant savings. The graphic standards for the common plant interface, like I said before, there's a thousand graphics. Um, this was in place for over 20 years. A lot of people worked on, on the system, so having a simplified HMI that has the same look and feel from every screen, um, that, was, that was a uh, big upgrade for the customer. The VMs were, were using a virtual environment. We developed everything in our office, and then we were able to migrate those on site, and um, it made uh, startup much quicker because we can just copy the VMs Everything was already tested in our office. This is an existing system, and there's a lot of I.O. that didn't work. There's a lot of I.O. that um, wasn't drawn correctly on the electrical drawings. So when we went through and did the as-built, working with the electrical, local electrical subcontractor made a big difference. They had worked on the equipment for quite a number of years, and they knew <laughs> the difference between what was what was there and what was actually in the drawings. So they helped out quite a bit using the local knowledgeable subcontractor. Um, we executed a DLR, a hardware factory acceptance test, before we went on site. So we staged everything in the office, um, made sure everything was working, made sure we didn't have any dead modules before going on site, and that um, was a big benefit, I believe. So with that, um, was there any questions?
Sorry about that, Tom. I've actually got a couple questions that were sent in here. Let me okay. read you this first one. Um, many times we see with the HMI migrations when the new solution differs from the existing system, there tends to be a lot of pushback. The process object face states were found to be more complicated. What were the factors as to why they ultimately decided to go down this path? Hi, uh, that's a great question. Um, one of the problems that the customer had in the system was there's a lot of complaints from the um, maintenance and operators that they couldn't turn on and off devices when they needed to. Uh, there wasn't indication on the screen or on the system why they couldn't actually do that. So um, going through this exercise with the process objects, putting in um, the interlocks and permissive conditions for every condition that could actually start or, or prevent a device from being started, um, that was a requirement for the project. So whether it was a, the process objects or a different system, we would have had to come up with that. What the process objects does, they give you a, a shell to um, provide that information for the operator. So we were able to go through, provide every condition that could possibly interlock the system and allow the operators to know, oh, you know what, I can't actually start the pump because of um, interlocks one, two, or three. So that was a, a big uh, savings. Okay, great, thank you. I got one more for you here. Um, it says, beyond this project addressing the immediate concerns around the legacy hardware and code issues, were they able to achieve any additional returns from this investment? For example, increased uptime, energy savings, optimization, et cetera. Uh, yeah, actually the customer did um, realize some savings um, as part of this project. About halfway through the project, uh, one of their process engineers um, was looking at the staging of the lead lag control for the air compressors and went, went through and changed the design of how the uh, compressors were staging. And um, by doing so, by changing that control scheme, they were able to change the number of air compressors that were, were required to run continuously from three down to two, um, and that saves a significant amount of money uh, each year by having to only run two. Um, they were, at the start of the project, they were thinking about or trying to evaluate whether or not they may even need to add a, a fifth air compressor uh, for their demand. But after we reduced the number that were required to run, they, they canceled that project because they didn't actually need that fifth air compressor. That's great. Okay, I think that is my last question. Um, so if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank the Banks Integration Team for presenting and for all the viewers for attending today. If you'd like to have additional discussions on this or related topics, please feel to reach out to the Banks Integration Team or to your local CED, Royal Wholesale, or CES sales representatives, and we can discuss further. A recording of this session will be made available for those who are unable to attend today. So if there are no additional questions, we'll go ahead and close the session. Thanks again for attending.